Like I said, I met George. I don't know if you had an opportunity to read his bio. And um, if you haven't, if you're going to hear an interesting story about how this man's transformed his life and the things that he's doing currently. Um, so, George, you know, who's George Smith today? So, so I guess before I go anywhere, um, I think there's a um, there's a reverence that I have to uh, push forward before I say anything, right? Um, I once represented a very uh, destructive lifestyle. So for all the uh, wrongs and all the destruction and all the vile things that I have done in my life, I want to first pay homage to those that I've been in my throughout my life. Every petty theft, every crime I've ever committed, I think we need to have that that measure of uh, I'm sorry to go forward before all of you before I say anything. So George Smith today, I'm um, a certified drug and alcohol counselor. I work for Oxygen Recovery Services. Um, I'm a peer mentor, I'm a certified peer mentor. Uh, I go into the juvenile halls each Saturday and I teach them how to write their own stories, to give themselves a voice, to give themselves an opportunity to just process their feelings on paper, right? Today I'm a, a, a man who's striving to be a citizen. Actually, I'm sorry, I am a citizen. I recently was released off of parole after 13 months out. That's exciting for me. Right? Thank you so much. I'm a published author. I said a couple of days ago when I seen Mr. Michael Santos, and I couldn't contain the fact that this is a man that I actually studied his works and adopted some of the things that, that he taught us and took that forward for myself. Yeah, I'm a boyfriend, that's my girlfriend over there, Jackie. Right, it's wonderful human being. I'm a happy man trying to put his life together. Initially, I'm from Compton, California, right across this bridge, I think it is. I right? had to make a decision in my life after 25 years incarcerated to remove myself from that place, to give myself a chance. And I want to tell you guys, all of you, I've been in this conference for the last few days, and people don't know that you guys exist. People don't know that you're out here advocating for them. No one has an idea that so many people in one place is advocating on their behalf. So I want to be that voice to tell you, thank you for advocating for us. And I say us for a reason. Right? I'm serving the humanity, Mr. Bob. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for Mr. Brent Cho for allowing me in this space today. Right? Super grateful for all of you. So that's the beginning. That's who George is today, man. I, I love my mom. I see my mom. She came to see me the other day. Right? Beautiful woman. Aging well. Just wants a hug on her son. I have another little brother who's there. He has 235 years of life. I have become the, the impetus to his change. So if my brother can do it, I can do it. That's who I am today, Mr. Hope. Yes, sir. Yeah, and you know, George and I have had conversations over the last couple uh, couple weeks, and you know, one of the happiest guys I've ever met, most positive people that I know. And you know, we need to kind of know who George Smith was, you know, as a teenager. So before the teenage years, let's just say six years old, right, is when my perspective of the world around me changed. Six years old, Compton, California, single mother, absentee father, prison is the culture, gang banging is the culture that's surrounding me. Six year old boy, Faced with the fact that other people have perversions, and it changed my perspective of everything around me. Right? How many people in this room have experienced trauma before? Just put about a show of hands. I'm sorry, I know you. Right? So we've experienced trauma. My trauma, my being sexually abused at six years old, changed my perspective of everything around me. And then there's nobody to go talk to about it. Who do you tell at six years old in a community where machoism is the is everything? 
six foot five inch men, 23 inch arms. These are my uncles, stepfather. This is what that's in front of me. How do you tell them somebody violated you? And all I know from that place is to just keep everything in. Can't go to my mother, wonderful woman, 26 years sober. However, she's in her addiction at that time. You can't tell, I couldn't tell anyone that at that time. So it began, the trauma began in that space, in that place, and my response to that trauma was to become an introvert and kind of figure out the world around me by myself. I can't trust anybody. Time progresses, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, I'm this little weird awkward dude who's in this city full of people and I don't wanna be, I don't wanna play with the bloody, bloody pet bull in the swimming pool. I don't wanna hang out with the gang. I don't wanna do none of that. So you're ostracized. I ostracized. With an inability to talk to anybody about it. My response to trauma was to turn into myself, take on all the identities and names and labels that people placed on me, you coward, you sissy, you punk, all this stuff, and figure out what to do with it. Time of progress, 10 schools, 10 different cities by the age of 17, my mother just kept moving. So instability, instability after instability, new neighborhood, new identity. What do they do? They're running, they're playing skateboard. Though. That's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be a skateboard. All right, time to move. They're in a BMX and tagging on walls. I'm gonna try that. So everywhere that I go, I'm trying to find a place to fit. Who would allow George to be George in any space? 17 years old, my mother makes a decision after moving us far away from Compton to move back to Compton, California. We move back to Compton, again, right over this bridge with one of these water or something. Get back there, and I have an ability to really, one of the sisters said the other day that she became a, a chameleon because she had been in this place where she knew so many people, she knew how to please people, all these things, and that's what I did, I took that on. And the gang became like this vehicle to just let out everything I had held in. These people didn't laugh at me, ladies and gentlemen. They didn't call me names. They didn't kick me. They didn't spit on me. They didn't tell me my shoes were bad. They just told me to come here. And all I had to do to keep that is just be as reckless and vile as I wanted to be. There's three things that took place in that. What's modeled for me, I do what they do. Now there's an expectation. There's an expectancy that I have in this community full of people that are committing crimes and hurting people. I'm gonna do that. And then there's a dictate. There's something next that I have to do because now I believe in this stuff. 17 years old, I wasn't even a gang member for 10 months. Wanted to play judge, juror, and executioner. And I took the life of a beautiful man and had the audacity to justify it based on the fact that he was submerged in gang culture as well. I was shot, I didn't retaliate, they laughed at me. You know that, what you gonna do about this? And in my mind, the way that I believe, the belief system that I held on to, retaliation is mandatory. I will not be laughed at again in my life. So I did. I thought that would reconcile me with myself. Somehow this act of, this vile and inhumane act would reconcile with George with everybody. My stepfather who hung himself on death row. All this stuff, somehow I can be just as bad as him or even worse. And it didn't. It destroyed so much. You know? Tore my family apart, tore his family apart, tore my community apart. And in fact, go sit in this box for 25 years, young man. Matter of fact, you're gonna die there. You're a menace to society. We will not tolerate your behavior in this society. So I went to prison with that same mindset, from juvenile hall to prison. 17 years old, the most stability I ever had in my life was in a prison cell. It's the most stable. I don't know how that makes sense, but I fell right in. This new space, these new people, how do I somehow thrive here? It's a new community to me. It's a new neighborhood. But I cannot be at the bottom of the totem pole. This is not gonna happen in this day. So I went full throttle. 
a winner. I heard some brothers' testimonies the other day. They gave master's degrees here in prison and all. I didn't do none of that. I, it was a new place for me to survive at. In fact, this is what my life was supposed to be, according to my belief and the people around me. Do 50 push-ups and like, make sure you get big enough. No one can ever violate you again. Yeah, what happens is... Anytime you're threatened, harm, hurt, do something. The very first talk I had when I entered CDC, at that time it was CDC. I recognize the rehabilitation now, but at that time it was CDC. The very first thing the big homie told me, everything that CDCR does, we do the opposite. I'm roughly about 18 years old. My first celly had been gone like 25 years in 1997. Okay, whatever they say, we do the complete opposite. So I can go on and on and on about that stuff. But what I found inside that space was that it was very lonely. It was very uh, fear-based. And the mental health there is just the problem of mental health is just horrible. People are forced in a box because of their behavior, for sure, to figure out how to manage loss of family, loss of relationships, loss of, of, of finances and sanity, and somehow come home and thrive. Somehow come home and thrive. Oh. Yes, sir, Mr. Hall. I can talk all day, sir. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, George and I were talking, and, and uh, earlier, and, and I, I bet so many individuals over, you know, my career, uh, working in, in the Department of Corrections, and yeah, it's, uh, you know, we've been talking, and somebody will say something that says, well, this is what we do here. Yeah. yeah so. We share stories. We, we 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 realize mistakes that maybe we made as a society to make things better. And, and we kind of want to know where, you know, what was the the moment? What was the things? Where where, where did the change start occurring? Because you were looking at a serious amount of time in prison. And, and and what was it that you know it's like that moment? It just kind of describe where you went to after that. So if I may, um, my initial sentence was double life plus 44 years. Um, I was sentenced by the time I was 18, so it was a wrap, right? And at that time, you don't parole, right? No one's going home. And uh, one of the, again, big homies told me, you know, uh, get comfortable. I didn't understand what that meant at the time. He's like, get comfortable. And we don't go home. Okay. Cool, to accept that, like, okay, cool, this is what we're doing, you know? And uh, one day one of the fellas went home, and it blew my mind, like, dude, he's, this is level four, he's going home? Like, to the, he's leaving here, he's going there. Yeah, he's going home, but that didn't apply for me. So, running him up in prison, again, man, I need to figure out, I'm relatively smart, I have an ability to socialize with people, communicate with different people because of the different neighborhoods. I need to be on top of this food chain, I need to make sure that I'm no longer helpless. I need power and I need control, no matter what. I lived that way for approximately 17 years in prison, smuggling drugs in prison, hustling, doing anything that I can. I have nobody in prison. Everyone who was supposed to be there is gone, but I think we're supposed to be there. 2012, June 3rd, I tried to smuggle drugs in prison. Manipulated a lady friend at that time to bring drugs, and I almost died in the process. Um, I think I've shared this with maybe Colin or someone before, but um, I get caught on camera. They have cameras in there to kind of, you know, you know, the visiting room so you'll see. And I get caught. And in the process of it, I'm eating my own feces to get rid of the drugs. A man eats his own feces. A woman eats her own feet, they're in the wrong line of business. How low have I gotten? That I want to make sure that I don't get caught to the point where I'm digging through my feces to get this substance and get away with it. And I almost kill myself. 
I was paralyzed and this whole arm here wouldn't move. The manner in which I got rid of the drugs, methamphetamine and heroin collided in my body. I had never used it before, just sold it. And I ended up paralyzed. My little brother, he's in, in the hole with me for, for a conspiracy to introduce. And here it is, I've had court cases in prison, I've had all this, and this was my rock bottom. That was my rock bottom. I'm eating my feces not to get caught. I can't move my hand. Will it ever work again? What the freak are you doing? When I was a boy, I'm a spiritual man, I'm a man of faith. My grandmother used to tell us all the time, you find yourself in this predicament, call out on Jesus, he'll come. So I did that. Lord, please don't separate me from my little brother. I've already gotten rid of the drugs. That's not a problem. I just don't want to separate from my little brother. That's all I have in his face. And it's granted. I made a declaration that I go to church. June 6, 2012, I was released from ADSEG. Went back to my cell with my little brother and I. Paralyzed, unable to move. All I could do was follow through with my commitment to go to church services. The door opened Sunday. I went to church. Long story short, there became a, a law of replacement that took place. I'm dragging myself to church, I'm dragging myself to church. You guys don't have to believe me, but I literally ran the entire black population. Last word is Georgia's. This is what we're gonna do. This is what we're not gonna do. So suddenly you have this man who's in charge of so much saying he's gonna be a Christian, he's going to church. And I went through with that. And I started hearing different stuff other than what me and the homies talking about over here on the bleachers, right? And then I started introducing um, I started being introduced to people that were going to self-help. I had no idea they had self-help. Started going to self-help programs. Alcoholics Anonymous, Cage and Rage, Life Without a Crutch. Suddenly, it was like this light bulb switch. Like I was meant more than to be in a blue scene. I was meant, my life was meant more than just being a freaking prisoner. Despite all the hurts, despite all the harms, I have value and worth. And I can be so much more than a freaking criminal. Even if I don't get out of prison, I can be more than this jumpsuit that says CDCR prisoner on it. Perhaps I can help other people be more than just prisoners. My little brother with this outrageous sentence, perhaps I can impart something in him. And that's where it began. I went to some groups and they told me that I had a problem. They told me that I needed to accept the fact that I had an addiction to alcohol, the lifestyle, in order for me to move forward. ACCI, I just heard the brother talk about his curriculum, for sure, the anger management curriculum it exists there. Michael Santos, different people had this information in their forums. We just had to grab it onto it and hold on to it and see what was going on. And then I started going forward. August 8, 2012, about four months after that incident, I gave myself a birthday gift. I no longer wanted to be a gang member. They told me, you can't do that. We don't do that, on. I don't want to be a gang member no more. I'm out. How much more do I have to do? Do I have to die to be one of the toughest? Do I have to be like murdered to be one of, to be accepted by this population of people? I don't want that for myself. Cut it through. August 8th, I gave myself a birthday gift. Yeah. And I stuck to it. And I never went back. And then I got exposed to more programs. And more programs. And I launched off from there. I ain't looked back, Mr. Host. Not one bit. Made level two, 2015, three years later after that transition. Went to Chuckawalla State Prison. And it was awesome. They had so many programs there. So many people doing wonderful stuff. Heard a man cry in the group. I didn't know we could do that. I cried with him. Right? Like, damn, would you cry? Cool. Right? I needed to get it out. I just didn't know when or with whom. And I got it out. Man, look at it. Ooh, this stuff hurt. That man hurt me at six years old. I can talk about this with you guys. How many people have heard the term hurt people, hurt people? By uh, show of hands. Give your hands just for a second. Cool. So majority of us has heard that. You want your spouses, even today. You know, your feelings are hurt. You might say something to last. I tell you, I do it to Jackie all the time. She hurt my feelings, I might say something slick. 
right? Because I'm heard, he heard me. So long story short, I started getting a hold of that. I realized that I had a desire and an ability to give information back. I wanted to be a mentor, just in a regular SAP building. I wanted to go there and help the people. Um, they have this program called the Offender Mentor Certification Program, right? And uh, the CC3 of the prison is like, I want you to, you know, try out for this, you know? And I did. I sent this to Solano, went through a rigorous training to become a peer mentor and a certified drug and alcohol counselor. So now I have a marketable skill upon my release, and while I'm there, I can help other people that are transitioning to society, right? So, got that done, gave my certification, and went forward, just launched. I was at CMC at that time, California Men's Colony, and then I kind of transitioned to, I returned to that prison after the education, and we were going through what's called a non-designated program facility. You guys aware of that? It was a state mandate where those who don't know, the California, the state of California said that, hey man, all those that are sort of protective custody, sensitive needs inmates, will be merging with the general population. Those that weren't, you know, you have, those are sensitive needs, rapists, whatever the case may be. Uh, people who don't, you know, run up drug debts and things like that. So long story short, they were merging. There was violence throughout the state, there were murders, there were assaults on officers, all this stuff. And I had this wonderful idea that was coming to our prison. We're in a wooden prison. California Men's Colony West is an entirely wooden prison. Bro, we have this education, Otis, who's my business partner. We have to do something. Let's see if we can counsel an entire population to make the right decision. As opposed to all those other prisons who went to fires and riots, let's do that here. Let's Scared to death, we did. Counseled over 850 men to make the right decision. Our then warden, Ms. Uh, Josie Castello, supported us. Give them a try, let's see what they do. And as a result, we had the most peaceful transition in the state of California. Thus, off, uh, Secretary then, Mr. Rob Diaz, put us up for release like no one had considered it. We just talked to the people. What's wrong with forgiveness? What's wrong with accepting these people for who they are? You, you murdered somebody and you're asking the board to forgive you, but you're not willing to forgive this man who committed a crime against whomever to come integrate with our population. Wh who's more important, the homies or your family? And we really just took the time like that. I really thought they were gonna kill him. I thank God they didn't, right? Because it's, it's not a good thing to do. It wasn't the best thing to do. And we succeeded. And we earned our freedom because of it. And not just that, we earned our freedom because we have been rehabilitated. Right? There was a rehabilitation that took place. There were some programs that were in place. Everyone's talking about reentry, and I love it. Thank you so much. It was such a struggle upon release in some of those areas. Social security card, birth certificate, housing, all that stuff. It was so hard. But the hardest part was changing the thinking to even get to the place where I could be released in the first place. So I could talk for Evans to host and tell him. No, it's, uh, I'm just sitting there in awe of, uh, it is, right? California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, we have a, a prominent or a profound gang problem within CDCR, right? It exists, can't ignore it, right? Education is mandated. If you don't have a GED or a high school diploma or a 12.9 TAFE score, you will be sitting in class. So what we're talking about is essentially having people whose thinking hasn't changed, again, becoming more sophisticated at criminality, sitting in a cell with a big homie with a bachelor's degree who's brilliant as hell, pouring this crud into you. Man, why isn't gang prevention mandated for everybody? Who has said they are a gang member, documented that I am a gang member. Man, have them go through the program. We're trying to be there. We know these people. They may not change. You cannot stop gang culture. But you can definitely change some people's minds. The way that they think, therefore the way that they feel, and the way that they act. We can change people's behaviors. 
again before they get to you and destroy what you're putting together. It only takes one or two to really just destroy the reputation of whatever you put together. Oh, look, they let those criminals out. I'm really not ready. But, you know, it's historic. So if anyone's listening, I want to get us in there. I want to get my workbook in there. I own I am. I once was, now I am. We need to be in there. It needs to be mandated. Even if you're in Florida, I see you way over there. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's it, Ms. Owen. What you